So uh, let me thank the organizers again a little bit more loudly. And uh, so I will give four lectures and uh, the topics in each lecture will be quite, sub quite different. So uh, if you don't understand something in this lecture, you can come to the next lecture and hopefully maybe uh, it will be better or maybe not. And uh, so I'll, I'll try to illustrate various techniques that appear when you try to solve counting problems. And uh, I will try to illustrate them in the simplest examples, but try to illustrate the ideas. And the, ex the examples that I'll uh, try to work out, I think, contain the main ideas that appear in much more complicated situations. So uh, in particular, if you have questions about anything that I am explaining, you should not hesitate to stop me as I'm explaining. And if I haven't defined some object that uh, you're not familiar with, I'm, I'm happy to define it here. So, uh, yeah, so the goal is to, for people to try to, under, to understand what, what, what I'm actually saying. And uh, to begin, I'll start with probably the, the simplest sort of classical problem, uh, which is called the Gauss circle problem. And it's concerned with the following question. You have Z2. in R2, and you'd like to understand how many integer points there are in the ball of radius R. So BR is x is less than R, where x is in R2. And uh, the question we're uh, one would like to understand is the number of integer points in this in this big uh, disk. And the, the fact, oops, the fact is, okay. so the fact is that, of course, the number of such integral points is proportional to the uh, area. So this is the area of, maybe I'll, let me put this here, the area of PR pi r squared. Sorry, if I move this, I think it will be better. OK, so uh, the area is quadratic. But what, what I want to discuss in this lecture is uh, how to deal with the error term. So uh, the easiest error term is just linear. So you can get linear error. And how do you see this linear error? Well, you put a square of size one around each lattice point. And you can see that if you uh, change the radius by, let's say, two, then the area, the area that you get here is an undercount for the number of lattice points. And if you change the radius by plus two, the area will be an overcount for the number of lattice points. So getting this linear term is uh, quite easy. So this was essentially known to Gauss. And uh, what I want to explain today is how to obtain a stronger error term, uh, which is, so this is due to Sierpinski. And it wasn't done today, but in 100 years ago. Uh, so the error term, so uh, you, you can improve the error term to uh, r to the two-thirds, and the conjectured error term is uh, exponent here is one-half plus epsilon for any epsilon, but, uh, and there have been some improvements to this two-thirds, but there hasn't been, the, the one-half hasn't been reached. So uh, as I said, I'll explain the, how to uh, pr obtain this error term today, but the techniques that uh, are used are actually uh, the kind of basic steps that will appear are useful in other general contexts. And hopefully in the next lectures, I'll start uh, connecting these kinds of counting problems with dynamics on homogeneous spaces. And there, uh, you can also get error terms of this type. So this type of two-thirds, so th there's even a name for this kind of two-thirds type uh, estimate in other contexts. And uh, the techniques are essentially the same. So if you understand how to do it in this simple case, you can do it in these more general 
context of semi-simple Lie groups and so on. Okay, so what, what, what is the plan for uh, proving this? So the plan is, is actually the following. So we're going to use uh, Fourier transforms. So we're going to take, uh, so we're going to define the function f of r to be this, uh, sorry, l l let me uh, introduce some notation. So define f tilde of r of x to be 1 if x is in br and 0 otherwise. So this is just the indicator function of this uh, big ball. And then we consider the projection from r2 to r2 mod z2. And we just push forward this function. So this is going to be our function that we'll work with, f of r. So you have this big ball, and you push it to this fundamental domain. And you see how it overlaps. And the quantity that we're interested in is we want to understand f r of 0, the value of this function at the point 0. And this is exactly the quantity that we are interested in. So it's the number of lattice points in the ball of radius r. So, OK. So this is uh, the object we're interested in. And we are going to proceed as follows. We're going to estimate the Fourier coefficients of this function. Then we're going to regularize f. Sorry? Ah, well, so what, 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 what is push forward? So uh, you just, OK, may, maybe let me, OK. I'll define it in one second. I apologize. So what, what I mean by push forward is you just take the function and you kind of throw it down. So if you want to evaluate the function at a point here, you take all the pre-images in uh, in, under the projection map, and you sum their values. So I'll, I'll, do, I'll write it formally. Let me, let me just write this. So for the f at x is defined to be the sum. So x is now an equivalence class of points. So it's the sum of this is f tilde of x, f tilde of x prime, oops, let's call this x prime, where x prime is x plus some v, and v is in z2. So you sum over all the values that you see above you. And again, this kind of uh, process where you have uh, your kind of uh, uniformization, you have this universal covering type object, and then you have a function defined on that, and then you push it to some compact manifold or some finite volume manifold. This is a standard step. OK. So are there other questions about uh, the objects I've defined so far? No. So, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to explain the, the plan of how we're going to do the estimates. So we have this function f of r that we've pushed forward. We're going to estimate the free coefficients. Then we're going to regularize f. So what do I mean by regularizing f? Well, f is not really even a differentiable function because of the edges, right? The function is 1 here and 0 here. So this is not a smooth function. And uh, things don't work so well for uh, non-smooth functions. And then we're going to, after we regularize, we're going to estimate again uh, what happens. And we'll see that uh, something good will come out of it. OK, so this is the, the plan. So now, we, uh, okay, so the first step is to estimate the Fourier coefficients. So I have to remind you what the Fourier transform is. So if you have a function, the Fourier transform is just the integral, say we're here at t2, of f of x e to the negative 2 pi i cx dx. So the, uh, we're going to work with Fourier transforms in either the torus or R2. So C is in here Z2. But if you 
take C to be an R2, then you're integrating over R2, and uh, X can also live on R2. Okay, so there, there's uh, this basic uh, Fourier theory. And uh, the kind of formula we want to use is Fourier inversion, which tells you that you can recover the value of a function uh, if you know its Fourier series. So it says that f of x is the sum of over xc and z2 of f hat of xc times e to the 2 pi i xx. So this is uh, the free inversion formula, but the problem is that it's not true in general. It doesn't hold for any function. So this holds if f is, for instance, smooth. So if f is a smooth function, this, uh, this formula is true. Uh, our function is not smooth, so we'll have to, to deal with this problem later. Okay, so uh, what is the main uh, technique for, uh, for uh, dealing with non-smooth with functions as free a transform. So I'm going to give you an exercise which I'll essentially solve later. I'll tell you the main idea, but uh, the, the exercise is the following. So if f, uh, if, uh, let me call it eta, is uh, ck, so has k derivatives, then you have an estimate for the free coefficients so if you take the norm, the absolute value of the C free coefficient, then, so I'll explain the notation in a second. It's less than F eta CK times uh, of C to the minus K. Okay, so what, what, what does this say? It says that, so let, let, let me explain the notation first. So I'm going to use this less than or equal sign, so a less than or equal b, and here we have x, if exists a constant c, which could depend on x, such that a is less than or equal to c times b. So, the, so what does this exercise say? It says that if a function is pretty smooth, if it has, CK, if it's, if it has k derivatives, then the Fourier coefficients decay up to some constant, which depends on the k we're talking about, and the norm of the derivative, the kth derivative, uh, they, they decay like a power. And the power is the power here in the derivative. So this is a, a standard fact. And uh, as I said, I'll essentially give you the idea of, uh, of the proof of this. Okay, so uh, we, I said we have to compute the free coefficient of our function. So we have uh, f hat r of xi by definition. So if you unfold that uh, projection, it's going to be the integral over rn of this f tilde r of e to the minus 2 pi i xi x dx which is simply the integral over the ball of radius r of e to the negative 2 pi i cx dx. So the function is 1 on this ball and 0 outside. And also notice that, so here we have the dot product, right? We have the dot product of two vectors, and the ball is symmetric, so we can rotate. So uh, rotating, so this integral is rotation invariant. So it means that we can take C to be 1, 0. Uh, sorry, not 1, 0, but absolute value of C, 0. So we can rotate C to uh, our free uh, coefficient to, to what, whatever value we like, and we can normalize it to be this. So l l let me draw a picture of what integral we're computing. We have this. We have this uh, sphere, and we've normalized our d uh, direction c to point in this direction. And you see, th uh, th this function does not depend on, so, so let me write this here. So c times x is c absolute value of c times x1. So if x is x1, x2. 
So it doesn't depend on the second coordinate. So we can integrate out this uh, second coordinate. And uh, how, how, how large is it? Well, if this is x, and this, then, and this is r, then this is square root of r squared minus x squared. So this integral is just going to be the integral from minus r, so we have minus r here and r here, then go from minus r to r of e to the minus 2 pi i cx, or absolute value of cx, uh, times square root of r squared minus x squared dx. So this is the integral, and so I'm going to, uh, so we're going to factor out the r squared here, so I'm, I'm just going to do a manipulation to normalize it. Can people see here? No, okay. Can people follow what I'm saying, or is it, okay. Sorry? I, I'm working with general what? Uh, yes, R2, yes. Everything is in R2, I, so thank you. Okay, so l let me write the integral. So we have an integral from minus R to R of e to the negative 2 pi I cx. So I, I lost a factor of 2 there, but it's not too important. 2 R squared minus X squared to the 1 half dx. So I'm going to write this as integral from minus r to r e to the negative 2 pi i d r x over r times 1 minus x over r squared to the 1 half dx over r and r squared in front. Okay, so this is just algebra. Hopefully it is correct. So now if you call the new variable x over r, so this just becomes the normalized integral, integral from negative one to one, e to the negative two pi i, your absolute value of c times r, times x dx. Oh, sorry, I forgot the main thing, times one minus x to the one half dx. So we have this integral, so let me, let me try to draw a picture of what we're looking at. We have something that looks like this. Okay, there's a two that I keep forgetting. So we have this function from negative one to one, and we're integrating it against this sign which oscillates more and more and more. So we're trying to integrate something like this, and we want to say that there's a lot of cancellation because you see this uh, integral this sign is oscillating. So we want to say that as this number gets larger, then the, we have lots of cancellation. And this was the type of pr uh, problem that is also illustrated in that exercise. So if you want, you want to say that if the function is smooth, then you have some cancellation. So uh, let me make the claim that uh, this integral, so I'm going to just call this c times r a parameter, so integral from negative 1 to 1 e to the minus 2 pi i. So I'm going to get rid of the minus because the minus is not relevant. kx 1 minus x squared to the 1 half dx is equal to O of k to the 3 halves negative three halves. So k is some positive, large positive number, a real number. So uh, assuming this claim, so assuming the claim, we found our first estimate. So we get that the Fourier coefficient, the R Fourier coefficient, so what is our k? Our k is c times r, and we had an r squared here. So we had r squared, and then r times c to the negative 3 halves, so we get that this is less than or equal up to some constants. This is less than or equal to, uh, to what? To r to the power 1 half 
times absolute value of t to the power negative 3 halves. Okay, so let me uh, write this first estimate so we'll have it in the future. F r hat of xi, oops, it's less than or equal to uh, r to the one half, e to the minus three halves. So I want to, uh, and I, okay, so let, let me make a few comments about this estimate. So the claim here, which implies what we, what we want is, so if you look in standard textbooks on this material, they'll tell you lots of things about Bessel functions and uh, Lots of words which somehow essentially mean this. So you, you, you have an uh, oscillatory integral that cancels out a lot, and you can, it, you can in fact have much more precise asymptotics. You can not just bound it, but you can uh, say it's equal to something plus uh, some error, but this is the only thing we'll need. And you should know that this, these, kinds of, these things are called oscillatory integrals, and in this particular problem, something that comes up a lot is Bessel functions. So you get an estimate of this type. L let me uh, remark the following. This estimate is kind of weak. So if you look at this uh, formula, this Fourier inversion formula, if you try to apply this uh, estimate, you're going to get that the function is not even summable. Okay, so this series does not even converge if you put absolute values with that estimate, and that estimate is essentially uh, accurate. So now we're going to prove the claim. So we want to estimate this integral. So we have you know, from negative one to one of squared one half e to the two pi i kx dx. So the, the way to estimate all of these integrals is the same, namely you integrate by parts. So integration by parts will give you that it's the integral from negative one to one. So what you do, you uh, differentiate this and you have to integrate this so you get uh, negative x one minus x squared to the negative one half, and here you have e to the two pi i k x over two pi i k x dx. This is just integration by parts, but you've gained something. You've gained the one this one over k factor. Okay, so you've gained, so this is, the, this is the key point. You've gained already a k to the minus one in this uh, decay, but this is still not too good. So I, I want to emphasize one thing, which, so when you have integration by parts, you have a boundary term. And here we didn't have a boundary term because the fu function vanishes at the boundary. Uh, here, this function already blows up at the boundary. So you cannot, cannot integrate by parts again. So you cannot integrate, so this function, one minus, so negative x, one minus x squared to the negative one half at plus or minus one is equal to infinity. So, so you can't integrate by parts again. So if you had a smooth function, you could do the same trick and you would do the exercise. You could do it as many times as you want and you would get as high a power of k as you ever wanted. But here you can't do this, so what, what can you do? What you can do is the following. So you have your minus one, one. And what, here's zero. So you, you will fix an alpha. So fix alpha, which, so, and consider, and, and you break up the interval interval into x is less than one minus alpha. So you set this parameter to be alpha and uh, absolute value of x is bigger than one minus alpha and less than or equal to alpha. So uh, let me call this interval A and this interval B. Okay, so, uh, so now you have to, to play a little game because you cannot integrate by parts, you have to do what 
possible. So you can integrate by parts on this interval. And here, so, uh, oops. So one thing I didn't mention is that this integral is bounded, right? This function, even though it's infinity, it's integrable at the edges. Okay? So since this function is integrable at the edges, uh, this integral is finite. So if we could just estimate this integral by absolute value, you, you would get a k to the minus 1. But we want a k to the minus 3 halves, so we're going to do this trick. So on interval a, so on interval a, use integration by parts again. And you'll get a boundary term. Uh, and on B, you can uh, just estimate by absolute values. Yes? So you can say it again? On B, yeah, so B is this interval. So this is B. This is A. Yeah? So the absolute value of so the absolute value of this term. Where's the typo? Yes. Sorry. One. Is this better? Thank you. Yes. So uh, yeah. Is that the only complaint or? Okay. So 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 the the point is this. On on this interval, we can get we can gain something by using integration by parts. On this interval, we cannot gain anything, so we just estimate by the absolute value, and we'll have to figure out what alpha is. So because I want to actually finish this proof today, I'll leave the actual integrations by, uh, uh, you know, I think it's clear what you have to do, and probably the effect of the coffee is wearing out, so I'll just tell you what the estimates are. So okay, so uh, what, what is it? Yeah, so on on B, so okay, so on B you get, uh, so the integral is O of alpha to the alpha to the one half, and on A, oops, on A it's the integral is O of one over k alpha to the minus one half. So you see that this kind of makes sense. And that if you make alpha to be very small, the boundary, the B term goes to zero, but this thing blows up as you would want it. And so you have to optimize. And it's clear, uh, so if you do the optimization, you get that the best choice is to take alpha to be k to the, uh, was it negative one half? Yes, negative one half. And you'll get another factor of one half, which will, so you'll get that power saving. And this power saving is essentially the, the, the key point where you uh, uh, get this minus 3 thirds and 3 halves, and this is the, what will eventually give the right error term. If you want, in the exercise session, I can actually do these integrals a little bit more slowly. OK. So next, we, sorry? Yeah, 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 sorry, minus one, you're right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alpha to the one half is k to the minus one half, that's right. Okay, so the next step is to do this uh, smoothing. So as I said, this estimate is not even good enough to sum the series. So what you have to do is you have to smooth out the function. So, so smoothing. So you have, so you'll pick a bump function. So you'll take eta on R2 uh, and B1. So, so just take a function which is uh, of integral 1, and you define eta epsilon of x to be 1 over epsilon squared uh, epsilon, eta of x over epsilon. So this is a bump function which is getting narrower and taller. And the, the normalization is such that the integral of, n, the, the integral of this uh, gadget is 1. 
So now you, you convolve these. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to smooth out the edges of our function. Sorry, I'm going to erase this side of the board so that I don't have to write on wet. Off again. So we're going to smooth out the rough function fr on which we have poor estimates. And then we're going to estimate the new Fourier coefficients of the new function. And hopefully, this will give us the, the result. All right. So, so the new function is going to be f of r epsilon is going to be defined to be fr convolved with a epsilon. So what is the convolution of two functions at x? It's the integral of f of x minus y, g of y, dy over, doesn't matter here, it could be rn, tn, your favorite group. Uh, so this is the convolution. So wh what does the convolution do geometrically? L let me just draw the picture here. So you have your function, so this is br, and convolution, a better, okay, I'll draw the picture here. Okay, so the convolution does the following. It takes your function and it puts, so it, it, it takes this bump function and it moves it around and it puts it, so it, you integrate your function this bump function against this BR, and since this has norm one, you see inside it's going to be uh, always, this integral is always going to be one, so it's not changing the function. It's only smoothing it out at the edges. So, uh, okay, so we have, let me write again, of R epsilon as F of R convolved with eta epsilon. Now, eta epsilon is a smooth function, so eta epsilon of K, of Xi, of the Fourier coefficient Xi, is less than or equal to any constant absolute value, any k, let's say, eta ck. Oh, no, sorry, l l l let me, this. So, so you get an estimate of the following type for times epsilon to the minus k. So you get an estimate for the Fourier coefficients of uh, eta, epsilon, in terms of the Fourier, uh, in terms of the ck norm of eta, which is a universal constant, eta is fixed, and then the epsilon gets in here, and then you have the c, which gives you lots of decay, whereas the epsilon, you see the epsilon is small and it's bad for you because it comes at a negative power, the c is good for you, it comes at a positive power. So, uh, and we're going to also use uh, two, uh, so let me write this estimate here, because this estimate is a little bit, uh, uh, okay, so this is something that depends on k, and then c times epsilon to the minus k. And we're going to also need a very trivial estimate, uh, which is that this is less than one. And uh, this is true because the, uh, this function has integral one, so this is a trivial estimate, but it's good in the regime. You see, this number can be bigger than one or less than one. When C is very large, this number is, this is a very good estimate. When C is small, this is not a very good estimate. So we're going to uh, use these two regimes for this estimate. And, okay. So we're, we're almost there. So I need one other fact which I forgot to mention. So fr of zero, fr hat, the first Fourier coefficient is just pi r squared. Because what is f hat r of zero? So we don't need to estimate this. This is the main term. It's the integral of a br of just one. This is just pi r squared. So this is the main term. Okay, so uh, so now we can apply Fourier inversion to uh, our 
regularized function, so fr epsilon, we can write this as fr, sorry, I can write this, ah, I, I forgot the main thing. Uh, okay, well, okay well, let me write like this, f hat r epsilon c times eta, no, times e to the 2 pi i cx. So we need to uh, compute the Fourier coefficients of this new function, but these Fourier coefficients are actually very easy to compute. So again, this is an exercise that we can do in the exercise session that if you convolve two functions and you want to compute the Fourier coefficient of them, of their uh, convolution, then you just take the product of the Fourier coefficients. So Fourier coefficients behave very nicely under convolution. So the Fourier coefficients here are basically the product of these two guys. And we have the following estimates. So we have the estimate on this guy, this kind of decay, and on this guy we have this kind of decay. So we have to estimate, we have to see what kind of information this gives us. And as I pointed out earlier, they're essentially the Fourier coefficients of Eta uh, epsilon, they depend. They we have two estimates for them. When the product of xi times epsilon is one, less than one, and bigger than one. So let me write this. So f hat r epsilon of xi is f hat r xi times eta hat epsilon of xi. So we're going to estimate each of these guys individually. For this one, we have a single estimate. For this one, we have the estimate when it's less than one and bigger than one. Uh, okay, and finally, the zero coefficient is just what it didn't change, it's pi r squared. So we have that f hat r, sorry. Now we have, oops. So now we, we're actually using the free inversion. So now we want to evaluate our function at zero. So we see that it's pi r squared plus the thing we want to estimate, some xi different from zero, uh, f hat r epsilon of xi. So again, we divide this sum into two terms. We have a, term a, where xi times epsilon is less than or equal to one and b when epsilon times c is bigger than or equal to one, depending on which estimate is better. And I want to, uh, again, so you see that it's the same game that we played in the previous uh, estimate. We have two positions, two cutoffs, and I haven't told you what epsilon is. So we're going to choose epsilon at the end, not now, and we'll optimize in terms of what we will get. Okay. Uh, so hopefully, so this is defined on the torus. So well, this function is so small that you can view it either on the torus or on R2, it doesn't really matter. So everything now is on the torus. But if you want, you can do everything on, the, on R2, but you'll just get integrals instead of sums. It's not, uh, the, the issues here are the exponents, not the summation versus uh, integration. Okay. So uh, l l let me get the, the right estimates. Okay, so we have, okay, so summation A is we have some zero less than C less than one over epsilon. And here we have R to the one half times C to the minus three halves. You see, so I'm using just the Fourier coefficient is less than or equal to one. The second term in this product, so this is a product, and the second term is just less than or equal to one. So this term is what? Uh, R to the one half times epsilon to the minus one half. And for integral B, 
So here, so the integral b is going to give us a little bit more savings. So 1 over epsilon is less than or equal to c. And so we're going to have what r to the 1 half uh, c to the minus 3 halves, then c to the minus k, then epsilon to the minus k. So you see now the epsilon comes in. And this is less than or equal to, so if, if you do all the estimates, it comes out to r to the 1 half times epsilon to the minus 1 half. So they're actually of the same order of magnitude as, uh, as it sh should have been in some sense. But uh, the, the point is, uh, OK, so, so what, 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 what is the upshot? So we're almost there. So the upshot is that our term, is our so we found the following fact. So we found that f r epsilon at zero is pi r squared plus O of r to the one half times epsilon to the minus one half. So it would seem that we can set epsilon to be, let's say, one, and we're we're getting the r to the 1 half, which is, uh, would seem like it's too good. But the problem is that, you see, uh, our function is a little bit smooth, uh, smoothed out. So we have here b r minus epsilon. We have b r plus epsilon. And we have b r. So our function f of r epsilon really is an approximate count. So we have that f of r plus epsilon at zero, so let, let, let me get the exact inequalities because, okay, sorry. So the claim is that, the, there are two claims. First one is that f of r at zero, so remember this is the unregularized function. This is bigger than or equal to f of r minus epsilon, epsilon at zero. So the, the, uh, what does this say? You see, here we're, we're doing the pure count, and here we have the regularized count, and the support of the function, which is in BR. So we're convolving this BR minus epsilon. With, we're smoothing it out, and its support is contained in here. So this function is everywhere positive, bigger than or equal to this. And so this thing, as we got here, so this is pi r squared, sorry, pi r minus epsilon squared plus O of r to the 1 half times epsilon to the minus 1 half. And so this is pi r squared plus 2 pi r, sorry, minus 2 pi r epsilon plus this o to the r to the 1 half times epsilon to the minus 1 half plus lower order terms. So now, uh, again, we have these two terms. So we want to balance these two terms out. So again, you see, we haven't fixed epsilon yet. So we want these terms to be of the same order so that we get some information. So we get, uh, so we want, again, r epsilon to be approximately the same as r to the 1 half times epsilon to the minus 1 half. And so uh, what does this give us? You have that r to the one half is approximately epsilon to minus three halves. So then uh, epsilon is r to the minus one third. So if you plug it into here, you get that f r of zero is bigger than or equal to pi r squared plus something that's, so if epsilon is r to the minus one third, this is this term. So you have uh, r to the one half plus one six, which is O of R to the two thirds. And for the lower bound, you say you play the same trick, but you'll have that F R zero is less than or equal to F of R plus epsilon, epsilon, and you'll get the same, uh, same type of estimate. Okay, so, uh, so, so, we, so we found, so let me just finish and just say that so we found this estimate, the number of 
points, integral points, and ball of radius r, so it's pi r squared plus O of r to the two-thirds. So uh, before uh, finishing, I just want to emphasize what were the main ideas that made this proof work. So first, we used the spectral decomposition, which is something that we'll have in a general semi-simple Lie group, and this is going to work more generally. And so we're going to be able to decompose our functions that we want to count in terms of this Fourier series. Uh, what you want to do then is you want to smooth out your counting function because uh, things usually don't work so well for these uh, rough counting functions when you just cut off at straight R. And then you want to have some parameters. You have the smoothing parameter and then maybe some spectral parameters and you want to optimize them so that you get uh, some kind of power savings when you've uh, played your games right. So. Uh, I don't think I'll do any other kinds of epsilons and deltas in the next lectures, but uh, I think hopefully you'll, you got the idea and probably the simplest example. So thanks.